Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone wherever we are in the Asia-Pacific region and in the rest of the world. Welcome to the Asia Convening to support parents and caregivers. This is the first of a two-part webinar series brought to you by the GISP, or the Global Initiative to Support Parents, composed of UNICEF, WHO, ECDAN, and Violence Against Children, Parenting for Lifelong Health, with the support of USAID. Our NEC, or the Asia-Pacific Regional Network for Early Childhood, is pleased to support the GISP initiative through this webinar series. This is aligned with our next advocacy for responsive caregiving and playful parenting, especially in the context of COVID-19 and our collective effort to keep young children, families, and communities safe under persistent humanitarian, environmental, and climate risks in the region. My name is Joel Lassam from RNEC, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. At the outset, we would like to thank partners who responded to our call for evidence-based parenting programs in September. We have received about 50 cases, and from this harvest, we are bringing to you eight cases for today's presentation. Our deck will continue tapping into this inventory of evidence-based parenting cases so that we can provide a platform by which we continue our learning sessions in the region, even beyond the GISP supported webinar series. Today, we will focus on why we need to support parenting, giving a spotlight on the importance of evidence to track the desired change you would like to see for parents and caregivers, as well as children across different development stages. We are also offering this space to learn from each other. And that is why GISP has taken much effort in choosing a diverse set of presenters today to broaden the opportunity for cross-country learning and to trigger opportunities for action, perhaps through enabling policy or programs to support parenting. But before we begin, just a few reminders. We encourage participants to write their questions using the webinar controls, the Q&A webinar controls. And we also encourage our speakers to respond in the same chat box. We might not have time for Q&A, but our questions and insights will help frame the next set of webinar on December 6, which, will be, which has been designed to be more interactive. That way we will have an opportunity to um, interact with one another in the second uh, webinar. Our structure for the webinar will look like this. We have two presentations for you, which, which will run approximately 80 minutes in total. You see on the screen the, ge the, the geographical spread of our presentations. And this early, we would like to thank our speakers and presenters this uh, afternoon. Of course, you will have uh, some preliminaries to frame the, the webinar this afternoon and some closing rights so that we know the next steps post-webinar. For the preliminaries, let me introduce all three speakers together. We will hear from Dr. Shivaji Good, who is the Regional Advisor for Health Promotion and Social Determinants of Health at the Southeast Asia Regional Office of the WHO in India. After Dr. Shivaji, we will have Shekufei Zonji of ECDAN who will speak on behalf of the GISP on the objectives of this webinar series. Then she will be followed by Dr. Zui Fang, uh, an ECD consultant from UNICEF, EPRO, and ROSA. Uh, Zui will speak on evidence-based parenting and mapping in the region. So without further ado, may we now call on Dr. Shivaji to be followed by Shekufei and Dr. Zui. Over to you. Dr. Shivaji. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much, Joe, for introducing me to this meeting. I must thank our GISP team 
the ANEC, ACTAN, EVAC, our colleagues from the WHO and UNICEF to organize this webinar. All of us are here for the same understanding. We know parenting is important. And for us, we know it is very important for the lifelong development of the person. And it is also very important social determinants of health for everyone in the societies. From the very infants to the old age, we all had very good experience on how we behave and adhere to the healthy behavior through our parents, to our grandparents, and the support we receive from the family. But the world today has changed a lot. And we know that parenting becomes more and more challenging. We see the societal change that put many families into a difficult circumstances. It's reducing numbers of informal social support that we used to receive. We have increase of nuclear family. And of course, we're not to blame anyone, but we also have the evidence of increase of single parenting that happen across age groups. And why I'm saying this, because single parenting can be male, can be female, can be younger age, and also can be those who are taking care of children when they are older age. These nuclear families bring us independency, independency in terms of economy, yet but it's caused a lot more of interdependence to institutional support. Especially if you look into how we balance the work, life, and the family activities together. At workplace, we need the support from the workplace to help us for parenting, uh, parental leave, support the crash within the workplace. So mothers can take care of breastfeed their child in the workplace. But at the same time, fathers also need to be given the right to do the parenting job. In schools, we have parenting, uh, parent teacher association to support parents and support children that growing up within the school age, including the early childhood educations that we see younger and younger generations go into the caretakers of the individuals who are working in the crash in the nurseries and many more. The roles of parenting has been diversified from parents, biological parents, or the grandparents, or the assistants at home, including domestic worker. We have a lot of questions. How are all of us be able to deliver effective parenting to children? The goal of parenting is definitely to have healthier childhood so we can expect a healthier adult life. And we see the impact of the skill sets of parenting to children's developments, ranging from the ways they play, the way they learn, what kind of toys do they have, how much time we spend with children, even what types of nutrition or food intake we have given to children. Who monitor the growth of children and who do the job of mental, mental and emotional support in the family? All of these components are important foundations for everyone to become healthier adult. It is now we have to move also from personal skills, the interpersonal skills, to much more institutional support for parenting because none of us can work by ourselves. The workplace can do as much as they can in terms of giving the leave, giving the tax break, giving the subsidies. But we also need the social protections and better than that, we have not even touched enough of what is the role of health insurance for children and health insurance for the whole family would have impact on parenting itself. I think 
numbers of socioeconomic factors are still bombarded on the parenting uh, arenas of, of, of the work that we are doing today. Evidences that we're trying to create today and numbers of countries that try to work today show us that there are many possibilities, but these evidence have to be available and easily accessed by, by everyone involved in this process. We also face different problems of violence against children. Sometimes it's about the crime, sometimes interpersonal, sometimes it's more on the cyber or, or digital crimes that's emerging. Last month um, in October, sorry, this is November. Yes, in October, we came together in the regional consultations of the WHO Southeast Asia region to discuss how can we better support early childhood development and adolescent health. We came up as a result that we need to do better and in terms of strengthening the government commitments and support especially the national leaderships and governance and financing to support parenting in different format. We need multi-sectoral partners, programs that more coherence, and definitely from the conceptions to the 19 years of age. We need to create a sustainable mechanism and create better awareness on parenting interventions amongst parents and caregiver. Very few parents, very few caretakers knows about existing interventions and what are the effective intervention that would be suitable for their social cultural um, background. We also need to make sure that we include male caregivers in the intervention that address gender equality. We have to think also further on technical support, financial support that increase the capacities of everyone involved in the institutions and also at the organizational level. We have numbers of evidences that need to be available and easily accessed by populations who need them the most. And what we came up with also how the media personnel can play very important roles in spreading these words and showing the evidence to the public. But nevertheless, raising a child is not a, an individual job. Raising a child needs the whole society. Therefore, coordinated multi-sectoral approach between different agencies, ministry, departments, non-governmental organizations and everyone like us who are here, we need to put our brain together, our actions together and put the issue at the right place and at the right time with the right actors. So I want to remind everybody, why are we here to support parenting? It's not just to support the parents, but the parenting itself. And it became important and very important for all of us to build the better society because we want to have a healthier childhood and healthier adult in the future. So I'm very glad to see numbers of participants here and I really wish you a very good deliberations and listening to all these lessons that we're going to be sharing today. Thank you so much, Joel. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Shivaji. Shekofe, please, over to you. Thank you, Joel, and thank you so much, Dr. Shivaji. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is my real pleasure to be with you today and present the Global Initiative to Support Parents and invite you to join the movement we're building around the world in support for parenting. Um, the, I'm speaking today on behalf of all the coordinating partners and the 100 plus partners who are supporting the Global Initiative to Support Parents. 
Um, so today, what I'll do is very briefly first review the evidence for why we need to invest in parenting, although Dr. Suvaji has provided a great overview so far, so I won't repeat a lot of what she said, what such support actually involves, how it can be developed, and then briefly introduce you to the global initiative to support parents and why we need it now. Next slide, please. So just as Dr. Suvaji said, we define caregiver as the person who's the most closely attached to the child. And as we know that parents, of course, are primary caregivers for many children, but for many others, Without biological parents, caregivers can also include extended family members and people working in organized daycare facilities and other facilities as well. What we are interested in is focusing on supporting parents and caregivers to provide responsive, nurturing care across the life course. So not just early childhood, not just adolescence, but bringing together initiatives that support parents from uh, birth to 18 years of age. Um, and we know what the benefits of parenting are. We all do. Dr. Suvaji just mentioned it from optimizing early childhood development, enhancing mental health of parents, children, um, as well as preventing child maltreatment and promoting positive social norms across all ages. Next slide, please. We know that parenting interventions are usually structured and they come with clear step-by-step -step instructions and job aids. They're delivered um, close to a particular model and a lot of evidence has been gathered on their effectiveness. Um, they usually focus on improving the interaction between the primary caregiver and children by, for instance, promoting communication, play, reinforcing positive child behaviors, avoiding harsh discipline, and supporting child self-regulation and problem solving, amongst many other outcomes. Next. What we know about the evidence base for parenting support interventions is that over the last 20 years, it's expanded exponentially, as you can see here. Just as of 2021, listen to this, there were 435 randomized control trials from 65 low middle income and high country high income countries, um, including several that showed intervention effectiveness in humanitarian settings. These studies show effectiveness across multiple domains of child health, development, and safety, including cognitive and social emotional development, mental health, and child maltreatment. We see these effects in poor and wealthy countries. We see them equally strong in younger and older children and are observed in high risk families, such as single parent households or those where children have developmental delays and mental health problems. So we have, we're sitting on this incredible evidence base, and it's really time for us to come together and make sure that parenting is front and centered because it delivers in so many outcomes for so many fields. Um, what we, GISP is not trying to do anything new other than trying to bring us all together. So we are building on what frameworks that already exist, um, you know, where the science is already translated into actionable recommendations and how to guidance for policymakers and intervention delivery agents in governments and non-governmental organizations. So the, we have some examples that we are showing here. These are multi-agency technical pa packages that bundle parenting interventions with other strategies like family income and economic support or dedicated parenting resources. So what we need to do is we need to come together across sectors and program silos, coordinate to improve access to this knowledge. So coming next year is the, the Global Initiative to Support Parents website where we're going to make sure that you have links to all of these different packages all in one, pla one place. So one-stop shop for parenting, where we can access resources on Arnic's website, on UNICEF's website, and everywhere. So that's coming in 2023. All right, next. So how do parenting intervention, support interventions work? They work systematically by usually de delivering some sort of core content on interventions for parents and caregivers, through in-person or hybrid or virtual means, and then supporting them to practice and internalize these skills. These in turn lead to improved parenting behaviors along many different dimensions you see here, which then produce positive child and adult outcomes and ultimately contributing to societal level outcomes that increase human capital and reduce inequities across so many different um, areas that we're all interested in. Next. 
so when we talk about intervention, we, what we do know is all parents and caregivers need some level of support and some need a lot of support that they can get. So parenting interventions can usually be delivered by professional or paraprofessional staff or by peers, group or family base or standalone or combined with other interventions such as digital outreach or cash transfers. Um, and today on the call, we're going to hear about some of these different modalities. So just going to the next slide. And this pyramid for us shows how parenting interventions can be delivered according to different levels of needs. And this is what we want. We want a robust parenting system in countries where we are targeting these different levels of needs. At the top of the pyramid, we have intensive interventions where we have combined in-person, group, digital outreach for those families who need all the support that they can get, the most vulnerable families, families with children with disabilities. And the next level down, we have targeted support for families at risk of developing bigger problems, which can involve family and group-based sessions like home visits, community groups, digital outreach. And finally, the third level down, all the way at the bottom, this is the universal support, making sure we're reaching all parents through integrating parenting interventions into routine services like health, nutrition, childcare, social welfare, and through multimedia population-based dissemination channels like radio, TV, newspaper. Next. And now it's my pleasure to briefly introduce you to the Global Initiative to Support Parents, which we've been calling GISP, as a lot of you have been hearing for. So why do we need GISP now? We need GISP to stave off a global parenting crisis, which we all witnessed when the COVID-19 pandemic happened. Um, because we need to ensure that all parents and children who need and want access to support have access to evidence-based parenting programs. In 2021, Listen to this. In 2021, only 26% of governments said that they were reaching all parents and children who needed such interventions. This is government self-assessment. Only 26% of them felt that they were reaching all parents and children who needed parenting interventions. This means that most of the world's children and parents are not benefiting from the many positive gains that parenting, evidence-based parenting interventions are proven to deliver, and that governments are not reaping the considerable social and economic benefits that can follow from enhanced parenting for all children everywhere. Where they do exist, parenting in interventions are frequently siloed across sectors. It's either a mental health package, a health package, ECD package, adolescence package. They're not seen as national priorities for investment, and they're not brought to scale. So the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted social services, created isolation, as well as leading to an estimated more, 5 million more children having lost one or both parents and caregivers to COVID-related causes. So we really need a global movement, a community, all of us to come together. That's what GISP is all about. And each of you working on parenting is a member of GISP. So we need to just unite and bring our forces together to advance this for all children. Um, so the next slide. So this is what the Global Initiative to Support Parents, which the founding core members were the Early Childhood Development Action Network, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, Parenting for Lifelong Health at Oxford University, UNICEF and WHO. And we have over 100 plus partners that have joined the call to action, which all of you can join today as well online. We try to create synergy between previously separate streams of parenting support work. We try to unify the evidence-based parenting work across the life course, um, from the child maltreatment communities to the early childhood and the adolescent communities. We're trying to accelerate and orchestrate um, collective action for scaling of uh, parenting work. And we're trying to do a lot of knowledge sharing and bringing awareness about the evidence of, um, of this. So it's our mission to transform government recognition and resourcing of evidence-based parenting interventions and programs to dramatically improve childhood health and well-being through targeted national assistance, international coordinated advocacy on parenting. Um, so this is, this is what we want to do today. And we're so excited to be part of this convening. Um, next slide, please. So just to go over, we have uh, GISP has four main objectives. One is to advocate for parenting support. Two, to generate evidence around effective implementation and disseminate evidence. Three, to innovate, applying amongst others, learning from the past few years, uh, what we've seen on digital solutions. Um, and four, finally, is uh, to bring effective interventions to scale and ensure their sustainability. Next slide. And I'm almost done, Joel. 
So what we are doing today, and you know, uh, this what you, it's exciting because this is now the Asian um, arm of the regional convene that that have been happening all year long. Um, and what we are all about is building on what has been done, uh, facilitating this knowledge exchange uh, through these regional and global convenings. We want to galvanize intensified action. We want to reinvigorate existing efforts. And hopefully, we can do some of that today. So therefore, these convenings that you are a part of today are designed to consolidate experience, streamline efforts, become more efficient, and ensure that evidence from decision making and all ultimately ensuring that all parents and caregivers get the support they need. Um, so we've had the Africa Regional Convening in June, which was three days long, 1,500 plus participants uh, had registered online. Then we had the Latin American and Caribbean Regional Conference in October. Uh, we had um, an in-person meeting in New Delhi uh, in, in October for the Asia Regional Convening, and now we have these webinar series. And coming soon will be the Middle Eastern uh, as well as European, and then the global summit, which will happen next year. So you can see that you're part of this global movement that's happening. Um, and so to this end, we the convenings are built around three interlocking themes. One, we want to make sure that you have access to the global evidence and guidelines, local examples of effective action, and government support for financing and scale up. So this is what these webinars will be exploring in detail. And I also just want to share a little bit from the next slide. Um, just last week in Uzbekistan, we had the, you know, something that happens once a decade, the World Conference on Early Childhood Care and Education, where GISP was present, we had a parallel session on parenting, we had strong ministerial level championship. In fact, you're going to hear from one of the speakers at that session from Indonesia. Um, but also, most more importantly, we managed GISP as a collective. We're already having impact. We managed to ensure that parenting was included into the member state commitment. So this is the second commitment to member states where it says increase access to evidence-based parenting support programs for all parents and caregivers. Um, and finally, so to this end, we hope that we, I wish you a successful convening. Uh, we really hope uh, that this does not remain, as Joel said, in, in just the webinars, but continued coordination and continued action and momentum building across the region to support parenting. And really a warm, warm welcome to the Global Initiative to Support Parents. And we really look forward to working with you in the Asia region and, and having cross-regional learning and together, hopefully we can reach every single parent that wants or needs parenting support over the next decade. Thank you, Joel, over to you. Thank you, Shekofi. Now may we call on Dr. Zhuyi, over to you. Yes, thanks so much, Joe. Can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, wonderful. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe Fang, a UNICEF EPRO and ROSA ECD consultant joining from Beijing, China. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm going to present the preliminary findings of our mapping of ECD parenting programs in East Asia and Pacific and South Asia. So our mapping aims to develop an overview of key parenting initiatives, policy environments, strategies, and practices within the EPRO and ROSA regions. It is expanded upon UNICEF's 2018 parenting mapping and guided by the nurturing care framework. We will use the findings to promote and advocate for um, family support programs with a focus on responsive caregiving giving for early childhood development. So this mapping focuses on three aspects, including the enabling environment and governance, program content and delivery, and inclusivity in terms of gender and disability. And we are particularly interested in programs that show some readiness for skill up. We will pr produce two regional reports, a policy brief, and six case studies by the first half of next year. So today we will show some initial results from 50 of the programs that we identified. So in terms of type of program, 38% of the programs are universal, designed for all families. About half are selected parenting services, which are targeted to disadvantaged families, such as in rural settings. 
We also found two countries, Philippines and Timor Leste, that are undertaking a systems approach, providing different types of services for different risk levels. And in terms of program content, the majority are covering early learning and stimulation, and slightly over 50% have violence prevention components, and 40% have or are developing content to address parental mental health problems. So moving to program evaluation, we all know that interventions can be costly. However, they can also be cost effective, especially because it is much more expensive to do nothing when there is a chance for prevention and then try to remediate when problems occur. And the rationale for rigorous evaluations of, of intervention impact is that evaluations are not as costly as untested interventions at scale who, whose impact are completely unknown. And also, there is evidence showing that many interventions with high popularity can actually cause harm. For example, a study of an infant simulator-based program aiming to prevent teenage pregnancy in Australia found that this program actually led to more pregnancies among teenagers. Then how do we know if interventions work? And how can we spend the limited financial resources more widely? So to answer these questions, we need to generate evidence to use rigorous evaluation methods, such as randomized control trials. And the good news is that there is a growing number of high quality RCTs of parenting interventions in low and middle income countries to guide the decision on what to implement. So in our mapping, we also find that there is a growing evidence base of parenting supports in ICRO and ROSA regions. Half of the programs are collecting at least some data to understand impact and delivery process. And 12% of them conducted RCTs using both quantitative and qualitative approaches. So there is a limited but a growing focus on the value of evidence generation and uptake. As one of our case study interviewees highlighted, until we know why, we can never decide how. So now coming to modality, almost all countries are providing in-person support using parent groups or more personalized services such as home visitations. And there are several countries starting to explore remote delivery options for a hybrid model combining in-person and remote, remote supports, such as in Thailand, India, Nepal, Philippines, um, Pakistan, and China. 28% of the programs use more than, more than one modality to reach and engage more parents. We know that provision of ECD parenting support needs joint efforts from all sectors, but we also want to understand if there is a lead body or ministry that oversees parenting services, and also how efforts are coordinated across partners and sectors. So this is a very brief summary of the lead bodies we found in each country so far. So in some countries, it is led by the the education sector, and some are within the social protection and welfare framework. And it can be governed by the ministry in charge of women, child, and family services. There are also many countries where there is not a lead ministry and emphasizing collaborative leaderships across sectors. And in some countries, the parenting programs we identified are mainly support, supported by NGOs. So these are the key points we wanted to share with you today. So this is a large review and we are moving towards data analysis. So when the reports are ready, we'll, we hope to see you again and share with you more details. So thank you very much for your attention and we're really looking forward to uh, hearing the case presentations. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Shivaji, Shekufi and Dr. Zhuyi for the preliminary framing of why we need to support uh, parenting in the region. We now move to 
the first set of presentations. Our first stop is Bhutan, where the prescription to play or P2P is being <clears throat> implemented by the Save the Children Country Office in partnership with the Ministry of Health. P2P aims to transform behaviors of parents and caregivers through play in the health sector as an entry point, presenting the evidence in transforming parenting and caregiving behaviors in the household and community with strong rollout strategy by the government are two speakers, namely Kinli Wangmo and Setrim Topge from Save the Children Country Office, Bhutan. Next, we listen to the presentation of Minderu Foundation's Thrive by Five International Program to be given by Melissa Tio, who is managing the content development of the program, and Dr. Haley Lamonica, who is a senior research fellow with the Youth Mental Health and Technology Team at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Center, where she leads the mental health, culture, and global child development research stream. Our third presenter is Ramjan Ali, manager of the Early Childhood Development Program of Plan International Bangladesh. From the lens of, the, of a transformative gender relations, Ramjan will take us to the evidence enhancing male engagement in parenting and caregiving through the Father's Cafe program in Bangladesh. And last but not least, we have, we have with us Dr. Vina Adriani, who is a professor in the Department of Early Childhood Ed Education, Universitas Pendidikan, Indonesia, and currently a director of the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, Center for Early Childhood Care Education and Parenting, or CIMEO SESEP. Vina will share with us her insights on parenting in Indonesia and in the region. So ladies and gentlemen, we listen now to the case presentations from Bhutan, Australia, Bangladesh, and Indonesia in that order, starting with Kinley for the case of Bhutan. Over to you, Kinley. Thank you, Joel. Uh, okay, good morning, afternoon, and good evening to all. Thank you so much for providing this great opportunity to make a presentation on multi-year project prescription to play, a framework to integrate, scale up, and sustain playful parenting in Bhutan uh, in this very important platform, the, uh, the GISP. Uh, in this presentation, the uh, agenda includes why prescription to play, uh, why we have initiated this program, and what are the goals or outcomes uh, that, are, that we are trying to achieve, and the components of the project, and also what we are trying to learn and what we have learned in the process of implementation. Um, to share some context in Bhutan, the National uh, the Nutrition Survey conducted in 2015 by DOPH, that is Department of Public Health, Ministry of Health, found out that 26% of young children risk of not reaching their developmental potential. And according to the Bhutan Multiple Indicator Survey, uh, only half of three to five year old children played at least four games with uh, children in the, in the last uh, three days. And moreover, Building Brains Pilot Project study revealed that uh, seven out of 10 caregivers do not tell their babies any stories. And uh, P2P baseline study highlighted seven out of 10 caregivers do not read to their uh, baby. One in two baby is spanked and three out of 10 children babies are criticized uh, and one in five is shaken. These are all from zero to 17 months of uh, uh, age. So in general, there is no or very limited knowledge on play and its impact on uh, long, long run. Caregivers are unaware of the negative effects of harsh discipline and also have uh, also, they lack knowledge on alternative approaches. On this slide, you would see that uh, if you compare the control and the intervention group, the control group is the blue one and the intervention, the red one. Uh, the intervention group was twice as likely to tell stories or read to their children. 
and and has more home midwives and the effects was strongest for families with fewer home positions. Uh, the pilot study impact also showed that in terms of pretty score, there is a, a shift, a big shift at the end line, although it was similar at the uh, baseline. The Playful Parenting Project has been designed to build on the strengths of the SCI common approach, that's the building brains, and to ensure that child, every child in Bhutan has access to the right element to ensure a happy, healthy, and bright start, start in life. This is reflected in the project goal. That's all children age zero to three will reach their full potential through an evidence-based playful parenting intervention. And we have uh, uh, three outcomes <clears throat> in order to achieve the goal. The outcome one, improve playful interaction between primary caregivers and their children, all age birth to three, and outcome two states improve practices among the workforce. When we say workforce here, we are talking about the health workers, the health assistants, and the district health uh, the district health officers to promote playful interaction between primary caregivers and their children. And the third outcome is buy-in from government to sustain that at scale implementation of the evidence-based playful parenting intervention. Now the project, uh, the P2P project is designed and it, uh, the design aims to operationalize the nurturing care framework, which emphasizes that all children need health, nutrition, security, and safety. Opportunities for early learning and responsive caregiving to ensure their optimum growth and development. development. Therefore, P2P activities and the key messages are all aligned to nurturing care framework. Uh, one, uh, we have uh, 12 key messages uh, developed and our key messages are all around early learning, uh, responsive care and safety and security. So to highlight some of the project key activities, we have the first uh, key activity is capacity building of the health workers and health workers in the sense it, health assistants and district health officers. And uh, we have uh, also the district, uh, I mean, like program focal persons from the Ministry of Health and then faculty uh, from the Faculty of Nursing and University of Medical Sciences of Bhutan. And the, one of the activity, key activity is training of trainers. We have a core group of trainers who then do the roll down training to the HAs and who the HAs in turn, they run the group sessions as well as the BCDST, that is Bhutan Child Developmental Screening Tool. And they, they provide the screening services to the caregivers. And another uh, key activity is mass media communication, uh, community sensitization. This community sensitization is done at two levels that are at the district uh, level, district stakeholders level, and at the community level for the caregivers, including male caregivers and uh, the um, you know, influential persons in the community. And we have uh, the, some program materials developed and pro uh, these are provided to the program sites, which also includes basic play kits. And these play kits also includes the uh, program uh, curriculum materials, HA guides, and then also some uh, materials for the caregivers, uh, such as take home cards and daily routine cards, and also the BCDSD tool, which the HAs uh, use to provide service to the caregivers. So next uh, part, my, co uh, my colleague Sitim Toki will uh, present. So over to Sitim. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Sitim Tobge. I am the male coordinator with the project. So uh, in continuation to my colleague, I will be presenting mostly on the uh, on what, what are the results and the outcomes of the project that we are hoping to uh, observe through the implementation of this project. As my colleague mentioned, we are uh, still in the process of implementing this project and then we have uh, we have just been able to complete the first phase of our project implementation. It is a three phase uh, implementation of this uh, P2P project here in the country, which is a scale-up 
project where we will be uh, reaching out to the whole country. So uh, in terms of uh, the research that uh, we are trying to um, capture through this project, we are, uh, we have uh, currently, we have uh, results and objectives that are yet to be finalized and then uh, observed over the course of the implementation of this project, but uh, that is still uh, a proposed a target that is yet to be achieved because the project, as I mentioned, is still in the progress of implementation. However, we have set up comprehensive uh, systems in place that will generate learnings on these concrete activities that my colleague mentioned that we have in, aligned in terms of implementing this project in order to achieve the, uh, the progress uh, proposed targets through, through the course of the three-year project period. So in terms of the in terms of tracking the fidelity of the project implementation, uh, the project has been routinely correcting, uh, collecting uh, information and then the progress from the uh, implementation of the project in the health uh, through the health services at the health facilities by our health workers in terms of the number of group sessions that is the primary uh, mode of our implementation and then also in terms of the individual sessions the uh, number of children, the number of caregivers from zero to three, the, that, the, that those who are attending these sessions, and then the monthly information that has been submitted through the indicators that we have already integrated into the uh, Ministry of Health information, uh, health, in, health management information system, uh, and then now the health workers basically their uh, progress, whatever they conduct at their health facilities will be updated through these systems and then submitted uh, monthly, which the program and then also the project team will be reviewing in the uh, and then wherever necessary provide support and recommendation uh, to the findings that has been observed through the uh, data that has been received. So these are some of the uh, process in terms of fidelity that we are uh, trying to observe. And then furthermore, in, uh, through the implementation of this project, we have been also working on the quality improvement that is we have uh, introduced the who developed uh, pokey guide uh, pokey to the uh, trained health workers on that and then we have uh, through that process adapted the pdsa plan to study act which is a quality improvement approach of the uh, pokey and then this is customized to our needs whereby we have been implementing it into a uh, virtual as well as a face-to-face -face manner we have uh, we have met, uh, developed a project application project app rather which is also a, a, a platform where the health workers come together to discuss uh, and then uh, bring out uh, different projects on the learnings of their uh, issues and challenges observed in the implementation of the sessions in their uh, respective health facilities and furthermore we also conduct uh, experience-based co-design uh, co uh, formative evaluation between the health workers the service deliverers as well as the service uh, beneficiaries in terms of the caregivers to come together and then discuss in terms of improving the quality of their services and then for the phase one districts we have managed to do this the findings has uh, as uh, that we have been able to come up through this study has been integrated which will be further refined and then taken forward in terms of implementing and expanding in the next phases as well as ultimately in terms of transferring it to the government so that is what we have uh, done in terms of these studies and then regarding the uh, knowledge attitude uh, and practices survey and also in terms of use of the credit tools for assessing the caregiver knowledge and practices in terms of playful parenting we have managed to uh, come we have com completed our uh, we have done the initial baseline survey on this however the uh, study on the end line survey has been completed but we are yet to come out with the concrete findings which we will be able to share only late, later on so just just to share on some of the findings uh, in terms of this project where we have uh, managed to capture through some of the studies that we have conducted as you can see that these are some of the direct uh, feedbacks and then the information uh, direct quotes from the health workers in terms of how the sessions are going on how they feel confident as you can see the study conducted initially before the implementation of their sessions right after the training uh, the health workers were not really uh, confident and not really sure of how, how they will be implementing these uh, 12 group sessions but as you can see uh, on the course of the implementation which was conducted some of the studies uh, somewhere halfway in into the 12 sessions they were they were really confident and then the, uh, uh, there's a vast difference in terms of the confidence level that as you can see in the, in the uh, ratings and also you can see some of the here some of the health workers speak themselves uh, how confident they became how they were able to share their uh, group sessions uh, and then have these positive impacts in terms of uh, 
parenting and then also in terms of delivering the regular group sessions and individual sessions with the health workers. So again, another small uh, finding in terms of the perspectives that's been shared by our caregivers, how the uh, 12 group sessions have managed to impact them in terms of changing their behaviors, attitude towards playful parenting and practicing it at home in terms of early stimulation, responsive, and then positive uh, caregiving uh, practices. So uh, I think I'll skip on, on the, in, in terms of the ratings, how uh, the health that the caregivers basically feel, but I think lastly, in terms of sustaining this project, uh, what we have managed to do already is in terms of integrating our playful parenting aspect, which is also uh, called the C4CD plus in, uh, in the national government system into the national child health strategy, which is a five yearly document the health workers prioritize. So we have been able to uh, integrate it in that. Also in terms of uh, including it into the health workers mandate, whereby we have already included it into the annual performance agreements and then likewise, which uh, goes down to the health workers, individual work plans, and then in, in terms of their deliveries. And lastly, uh, a future plan that future as in it, it's something that we will be doing on the course of our project implementation, which hasn't started yet, is in terms of integrating the playful parenting into the in-service, I mean, pre-service uh, curriculum uh, of the uh, ministry uh, of the KGUMSP, the university that my colleague mentioned earlier. And also in terms of creating an online learning forum, such as the uh, CME Continuing Health Medical Education, which will be building, uh, which the health workers will be motivated in terms by receiving credits and taking these learnings forward. So I think uh, a small snapshot of what some of our health workers have managed to share in terms of their uh, implement through the implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken Lee and Satrim. May we now call on Melissa for the Minderu uh, Drive by Five presentation. Over to you. Great, thanks, Joel. Um, would you be able to stop screen sharing so I can screen share? Great. Can everyone see that? Great. Yes, perfectly um, fine. Perfect. Hello, my name is Melissa Teo and I'm joining you all from Perth, Western Australia. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Noongar people of the Wajak Nation, and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. It's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about Mindaroo Foundation's Thrive by Five International Program, and we'll be alongside Dr Hayden and Monica, our research partner from the University of Sydney Brain and Mind Centre. So Mindaroo Foundation is one of Asia Pacific's largest philanthropic organisations and has been in operation for 21 years. Our vision is ambitious but simple, to unrest on fairness and create opportunities to better the world. We believe part of this begins with early childhood development and Thrive by Five is one of 11 key initiatives of Mindaroo Foundation founded by Andrew and Nicola Forrest. So neuroscience has taught us that the first five years of a child's life lay the foundation for lifelong development and well-being, and yet there remains limited and sometimes conflicting information about the importance of these early years, starting from conception. Our vision at Thrive by Five is to inspire an increased understanding of and focus on the importance of early childhood development and to ensure that children, regardless of where they were born, thrive by the age of five. To do this, our program aims to increase awareness and empower parents and caregivers with the knowledge they need to support the healthy development of their child. Importantly, to ensure access to this valuable information, regardless of where they were born, socioeconomic status, literacy, gender, or other barriers such as digital literacy. And unfortunately, the field of ECD has largely been dominated by Western or individualistic notions of parenting. Our aim is to disrupt this generalist approach by offering evidence-based parenting information, which is underpinned by culture-specific knowledge. By empowering parents and caregivers with information that is familiar and accessible, we hope to create a positive impact on their knowledge, self-confidence, behaviours, with the goal of creating a movement for change globally. So we know in our current age, um, especially after COVID, mobile technology has increasingly become a powerful tool for disseminating health messages, and it can actually help break down barriers such as affordability and accessibility. To harness this, our program has incorporated a multi-channel approach and it consists of three main pillars. One, 
the Thrive by Five TED Talk, an awareness raising video that's been subtitled or dubbed into 33 different languages and was the number one TED Talk in the world in 2021. Two, the free Thrive by Five app, our flagship product that was developed to ensure maximum accessibility, taking into account connectivity restraints and available offline once downloaded and even on aging and lower tech devices. The app also includes an audio recording feature so that parents and caregivers with limited literacy or education are not further disadvantaged. And three, the Thrive by Five content, which is at the heart of our program and developed through a series of co-design workshops with local parents and experts to ensure that the app and its content is adapted to each country from the language to the illustrations and the local examples referenced in the activity. This content is in turn disseminated by print, radio, television, WhatsApp, and most importantly, through the trusted messages in the community. So today, I'm proud to say that our program is now live in five countries, but to highlight how we've implemented our approach, we would like to focus on our work in Afghanistan, where we launched our program on the 31st of May this year. The Thrive by Five app, with the local name of Mano Kodakom, is the first app of its kind in Afghanistan, with content available in both Dari and Pashto. Integral to this was our collaboration with our implementing partner in Afghanistan, the Bayat Foundation, a philanthropic organisation that strives to nourish the lives of at-risk mm. families in Afghanistan, and our, and our global research and evaluation partner, the University of Sydney Brain and Mind Centre. So now I'll hand over to Hayley from the university to talk in more detail about our co-design process in developing the app and content and the result in early learnings from our evaluation. Thanks so much, Mel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, from which I'm presenting, which are the Gadigal people of the Iora Nation. So our team, as Mel mentioned, at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Centre, we're responsible for leading the content development process for the Thrive by Five International Program. So the content, as you can see here, is referred to as collective actions, and this is really to highlight our collectivist approach to parenting and child rearing. So each collective action is comprised of the why, which presents scientific information about early childhood development in approachable lay language, and then the whys are always coupled with um, child rearing activities that parents and caregivers, trusted members of the community can engage in with the child to support that aspect of development. Next slide, great. Um, so the initial uh, content itself was developed from a comprehensive social, anthropological and cultural review of all the factors that impact on child rearing in Afghanistan as well as um, really an in-depth search for local examples of songs and dances, children's stories and children's authors, festivals, important locations and foods with the aim of really localizing the content to the Afghan context. And finally, we included contributions um, from a panel of Afghan uh, subject matter experts in areas of early childhood development, psychology and education, among other things, to ensure we were getting um, accurate results in terms of the um, context. So after this initial um, development and review process, the content was then populated into a beta version of the app to be tested directly by Afghan parents and caregivers. We then um, hosted a series of eight co-design workshops, both in 2021 and 2022, to really try to examine, among other things, the cultural appropriateness and the relevance of the content for the Afghan context. And you can imagine that this was particularly important after the Taliban regained control of the country in 2021. So um, some of the key changes that resulted from the co-design process are, are presented here. So these included the need for more examples of activities that can be done safely indoors. So we've learned that children and mothers are really restricted largely to the home. So parents were really eager for more activities that they could conduct, conduct safely um, at home as opposed to outdoors. We also revised the content to remove any activities that involved singing or dancing outside the home. Um, due to restrictions on public engagement in these times of uh, in these kinds of activities. Um, and finally, as mothers are, are typically burdened with domestic tasks and child rearing activities, um, it was recommended that we more explicitly encourage the involvement of fathers and other potential caregivers in the content to try to reduce some of the stress and the burden on mothers. Next slide. 
Um, you can see here that we also developed new content specifically based on the feedback um, and the requests of parents and caregivers in the workshops. Um, so here's an example of a new collective action about sibling rivalry um, with information about how parents can help support older siblings as they adjust to the arrival of a new baby. So once we have the full content base and the app is launched in, the, um, in Afghanistan, we then collected data about the impact of the content on parenting practices and attitudes, behaviors, and confidence through a cross-sectional survey that was completed by parents and caregivers in Afghanistan approximately four weeks after the release of the app. Great. So we had a total of 111 um, participants with fathers responding more frequently than mothers to the survey. Um, import importantly, all participants reported that the activities made them feel more connected to their child, as well as helped their child connect directly to their community and to their culture. And quite interestingly, um, the activities that included singing, um, so things like singing lullabies at bedtime, were actually the most frequently accessed, which is quite notable given the restrictions on um, music in the country. Um, so we included in the survey um, a parent, the parenting and family adjustment scale, which is a validated measure of parenting behaviors and practices specifically in response to parenting um, interventions. And while we didn't see any significant differences between mothers and fathers in terms of their responses on this questionnaire, what we did see was the emergence of two distinct groups of mothers. So specifically, one group was reporting higher levels of stress and sadness and lower levels of life satisfaction and familial support, whereas the, other, the second group was reporting the opposite. So lower levels of stress and sadness and higher levels of satisfaction and familial support. And quite importantly, this latter group was also reporting increased use of these responsive nurturing care practices based on engagement with the app content. So these results really highlight the need to develop content to better support the mental health and well being of parents, including those raising children in conflict areas such as Afghanistan, as well as to ensure that we really have effective means of disseminating content to these time poor mothers who are typically responsible for childcare and often have no other access to supports. Great, thanks so much, Haley. So just to summarise some key learnings, we know that strong partnerships are really integral to what we do in order to deliver quality, evidence-based and accessible content. Two, an iterative co-design process is crucial to first understand, then respond to the specific needs of local parents and caregivers in order to drive sustained impact. And three, there is no one-size-fits-all model and our collaboration with in-country and regional partners are gonna be the key to the success of our program. So on behalf of Minjururu Foundation and the University of Sydney, just want to thank you all for your time and especially um, for the group for convening and giving us the opportunity to share with you our work. Thank you, Melissa and Haley. Uh, may we now call on Ramjan for male engagement in Bangladesh. Over to you, Ramjan. Um, thank you. Um, Uh, can you, um, you can hear me now? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, thank you. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, this is Shom John, working with Plan International Bangladesh. Um, and uh, today I am going to share with you a model that we developed uh, under our Gender Transformative Early Childhood Development Project. Um, so welcome. So before that, I would like to share the background why we developed this model. So Plan International Bangladesh is implementing gender transformative projects since 2019 in collaboration with three implementing partners. These, these are South Asian Partnership Bangladesh, Kurofi, and Kitchen Warsaw Bangladesh. And whenever we are going to implement this project, we found that um, early childhood development cannot only the classroom teaching learning process. Uh, we need to focus on the uh, involvement of the whole family member. We need to change the culture of the family. So we, we thought that we should need to focus on the male investment uh, in early childhood development. That is very gap in Bangladesh context. And considering the social cultural context of Bangladesh, we, we developed a model that's called Father's Cafe, uh, 
And uh, the intent of this model is to engage fathers and sensitize them for increasing their involvement, interaction with their children, and foster their children's holistic development. So um, that was the background of this model. And so what is Father's Cafe? Um, uh, Father's Cafe is a uh, community-based volunteer group of fathers who have zero to eight year children. So in the East Cafe, um, we are not saying it's, it's a group because it is a little bit informal so that they feel comfortable and share their experiences like a cafe. And East Cafe, there are 22, 25 fathers are in this a member. Uh, we form 130 fathers cafe um, in uh, two, uh, two different geographical locations in Bangladesh. And uh, I shared that this is the comfortable place so that fathers share their experiences like this uh, in this space that only um, 11 or 13 percent parents are involved in the uh, child caring area. That is, um, that is uh, only, only 13 percent. So we, we are trying to increase this so that children get um, a comfortable in um, environments um, in support of his family members. So um, what's motivation? I already shared that um, traditionally in Bangladesh, child rearing is considered the mother's responsibility only. So rarely um, fathers um, engage in child rearing, caring, they feel ashamed sometimes for their um, that to play this role as a um, child um, care giver, sort of like this, to, to respond to take responsibilities. So, um, the, as well as there is a common here discriminatory practice that mother only the engage in parenting, nurturing care, and fathers are mainly focused on the um, work, income generating work in Bangladesh till now. So. This is the discriminatory gender norms that are growing from the early age. So Plan International Bangladesh is focusing on gender equality. So we are trying to work in the very early age when children's norms, values, and brain is developing. So uh, we thought that we, this is the area where we can work and bring more um, sustainable uh, changes um, in the communities to uh, foster uh, gender equality. So uh, we, we focus on that, how parents, uh, different parents are practicing, uh, engaging with his children's, um, children's stimulation interaction. So in the father's cafe, they are sharing the experiences so that everybody will feel that, oh, I'm doing the same. Uh, so why not I am sharing? So we are trying to change the, um, bring the change in the, uh, in the mind of the fathers and make them comfortable that this is not a shaming work for them. So it is an honorable work. So they can be more motivated and engage in the uh, child caring and rearing. So uh, we, 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 there are some objectives to, I already shared, equal, uh, equal participation of fathers, male members in the family, and as well as equal uh, opportunities to growth and development boys and girls. So, um, and through this model, we are trying that every child, whether it is girls, boys, or any other um, or, uh, identities, so they will get equal opportunities uh, for growth and development. And we are trying to ensure the non discriminatory social system, removing traditional practices so that the children's fathers. Mothers have a ritual sharing their words. They are um, cooperating in morning in their families so the children will like um, get that. Yes, my fathers and mothers are supporting each other. That is the common norms in the community so that we that will be they will practice in, in, in their life also. So uh, in the father's cafe, what we do? So every um, month, a father's cafe members get sessions on child, their roles about child caring, rearing um, for the children policy development. After getting the session, every father's uh, cafe member has the responsibility to cascade this lesson to his uh, nearby um, fathers. 
so that will not um, like this the bind within the other cafe members so it, we will be able to reach more people and so this um, intervention investment and we identify like this the we are identifying the best father who has most significant change in the common practice in the routine so we are increasing the fathers to change his routine and allocate particular time for the children's peace and spend quality quality role, in quality manner so we are encouraging in the fathers that they are, will do support household chores and, and they will engage the female members in decision making and educational activities also financial decision they will engage so that children um is zero to eight years will also learn that um in their family has the equal um equal uh, responsible unity practice in their family so as you like this uh, what things we uh, bring uh, so this model we uh, we found that every other staff members are now taking care of the children they have a fixed allocated time um whatever he is doing they spend time with the kid as well as 100% father staff members are also sharing the household chores like you can see the picture that father is helping um, his uh, mother uh, to in the cooking so so like this also learning for the children so that they will also take time get free times to spend uh, times with the kids together so that will be more um, uh, fruitful and what challenges we face to implement this model um, in bangladesh in practice we shared that fathers mostly work in, in the income generating world so sometimes we have not been able to find get the, all father session members together so we have to conduct the session in the evening sometimes so that was the challenge to implement this model and um so there are uh, some um, thought that the expression from the fathers that what that um on father said from dhaka said that um uh, now i spend more time quality time with my daughter and uh, i know how to play how to um, engage my children in with num in different games and stimulate uh, for his you know, holistic development so that is the message we received from the fathers and they are now more responsible in their child caring journey um that's all uh, thank you all right thank you for that very interesting presentation um ramjan may we now listen to the views of uh, dr vina from simeo sesep over to you Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I cannot share my screen. Uh, I think Ram you Jan, kindly uh, uh, stop screen share, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, very good afternoon uh, from Indonesia. Good morning, good evening, good night to everybody from all over the group. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the committee for inviting me to participate in this important webinar. So um, let me introduce myself. My name is Fina Adriani. I'm uh, currently the director of Siamio CISEP. Siamio CISEP is uh, Southeast Asian Minister of Education Organization, Regional Center for Early Childhood Care Education and Parenting. So uh, uh, this is just a brief introduction, introduction to our center. So our center has been established since 25 July 2017. So we are still very young, only five years old. And we are uh, one, uh, we are part of the seven CMO centers in Indonesia and also part of part of the 26 CMO Center in Southeast Asia. So our main uh, responsibility is to conduct research, organize capacity building, and also providing advocacy to the policymaker, government, uh, and also practitioner on early childhood education, care, and parenting. So uh, the topic that I'm going to present today is I'm just going to um, 
uh, highlighting some of the programs that we have. Uh, my apologies um, uh, for those of you who, who attended the uh, UNESCO World Conference a week ago, because some of the things that I'm going to mention in today's presentation is basically going to be quite similar to what I've presented in the, in the conference. So, um, uh, Again, uh, just briefly introduction about our center. So uh, our center is sort of like uh, situated in two different contexts. Uh, one, we are part of the Ministry of Education Culture in Indonesia, but at the same time, we are also part of the Southeast Asian Minister Organization, Minister of Education Organization um, uh, in, the, in the region. So, but for today's presentation, I'm just going to um, focus um, our program in the context of Indonesia. So uh, when we are talking about parenting uh, program in Southeast Asian in general, I think uh, it also has been mentioned by previous speakers that when we are talking about parenting in Southeast Asian, uh, we are dealing with some of the challenges. Uh, we are dealing with, for example, uh, an absence of universal childcare that hinder parents, particularly mothers' participation in the public. In the Southeast Asian context, I think we are still facing the higher rate of child marriage that resulted in the, in the poor parenting practices. And also, we are also facing some traditional gender roles that inhibits further involvement in the parenting. So I really applaud the initiative uh, taken by Ramjan Ali from Plan International to include more parents in the parenting process because I think we really need that kind of, of, of initiative. And also, uh, we are also at the moment facing um, the diversification of family, the rising of single uh, parents, the, the expansion of um, the expansion of the of the, of the uh, family um, uh, meaning, you know, so we are, we are also uh, facing uh, some changes in the structure of the family. And when we are talking about parents, we also need to recognize that some parents are unable to perform their parenting roles because of the poverty that hinders them to become a good parents. I think uh, I will also be talking about this a little bit later, but I think when we are talking about parents, I think we also need to go beyond deficit model of parenting. We need to recognize that some parents, they have blockages, they have obstacle that prevent them uh, to become a good parents. And very often, those blockages, those obstacles are coming from poverty and also unequal access to health and education. And also, we also are facing with uh, globalization. Uh, the world is becoming more and more uh, collide and the technology is developing very fastly. And I think to some extent, it also affects the way family is uh, constructed. So in Indonesian government, uh, when we are talking about parenting programs, uh, definitely, without any doubt, uh, parenting programs plays a very important role roles in Indonesian early childhood education care provision. Uh, up to the moment, uh, there has been some uh, regulation uh, pertaining parenting. For example, we have the Ministry Regulation Number uh, 30, year 2017, uh, that recognized the importance of including parents in the educational setting. And uh, since, 2000, since 2020, since 2020, the Indonesian government, the Ministry of Education and Culture in Indonesia has also uh, emphasized that one of the indicators of high quality early childhood education care provision is that uh, the center must have a parenting program. And we also have a presidential decree number 60 year 2013, where this regulation calls for the holistic and integrated approach to early childhood education care. And within this program, parenting is very much uh, the focus. So uh, I think the holistic and integrated approach to early childhood education really calls for inter collaboration, joint collaboration and joint forces between several ministries. So we have Ministry of Education and Culture, we have Ministry of Health, we have Ministry of Women's Empowerment and uh, Child Protection, we have Ministry of Village, we have Ministry of Home Affairs, and they are all working under the coordination of the National Planning Agency. So this holistic and integrated uh, models to parenting, I think it allows us to see uh, parenting as a shared responsibility. I very much agree with um, the first speaker who said that when we are talking about parenting, we need to have a shift of paradigms that parenting is no longer individual responsibility, but we need to see parenting as a shared responsibility that it takes um, a whole society 
society, an extended family estate for young children to be able to develop fully. And under this um, regulation, it also allow us, as I've mentioned before, to go beyond the deficit models of parenting. Because for example, using this holistic and integrated model, the Ministry of Social Affairs, for example, they are able to provide cash tenant transfer to, to uh, some of the poorest family in, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas. And I think it is very important because uh, again, when we are talking about parents, we need to realize, we need to understand, to recognize the obstacle faced by the parents. And very often some of the obstacles are coming from, from the, the poverty. And we also have several other laws. For example, we have law number 35 year 2014 on child protection. And then we also have particular regulation about child caring and rearing. It is important, however, to note that these two particular law about child protection and child caring and rearing, they are talking about parenting in the non-traditional context. So they are talking about parenting, care, uh, parenting for children who are uh, coming from underprivileged background. They are talking about a parenting program uh, provided by the Department of Social Affairs for children who are uh, becoming the victim of domestic violence, for example. But nevertheless, this tool also uh, recognize the government's initiative to pay more attention to the parenting issues. And then um, it's also very interesting that uh, since 2020 in Indonesia, we have a specific regulation about stunting reduction. And I think uh, stunting in Indonesia is a major issue. It is a health issue. But um, uh, when we are talking about stunting, I think, again, there is a need to deal stunting from a holistic approach. And CMU says that uh, since uh, last year, we have been tagged by the National Planning Agency to become one of the center in the countries that are re responsible for stunting uh, prevention. So uh, what we do is basically trying to provide a parenting program for the parents so that parents have adequate knowledge on how to deal with stunting issues. And at the moment, there is also the, uh, the government is also preparing the draft law of mother and children's well-being. The draft is still ongoing, but if the draft is released, then the draft will allow mothers to have extended uh, maternity leave. And also, uh, even uh, fathers will be given an opportunity to also take a paternal leave and also making sure that child care services is becoming more accessible and more affordable, especially from parents who are coming from underprivileged background. So uh, uh, in, in our attempt to work closely with the government in order to help the government's program. In CMS, SF, we are trying to establish several programs. Again, please bear in mind, our center is a new center. We are only five years old. So at the moment, what we are trying to do is we are uh, developing some baseline study in order to develop this parenting model. So because as we mentioned, as I've mentioned before, that uh, stunting is a big issue in Indonesia and the government in Indonesia see a parenting program as an opportunity to, re to, to prevent stunting by providing an educational prevention uh, that will help uh, parents to have a better knowledge about 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 health and nutrition. So at the moment at our center, we are trying to develop parenting program for stunting uh, prevention. So this program is basically consists of three, uh, this model is basically consisting of three different programs. We have the uh, program that focus on the strengthening the information, not only for the parents, but also for the teachers and also for the district government. Because again, as I've mentioned, when we are talking about parenting, we, we need to see parent as a share, parenting as a shared responsibility. And then uh, we also have a specific parenting modules to strengthening parents' knowledge and skills. And here in our module, there is also a specific model on the father's involvement because I think it is important that we use parenting program as an opportunity to disrupt traditional gender roles that often inhibits par, uh, fathers from participating fully in the, in the parenting process. And then we are also uh, preparing a counseling programs because I think, again, uh, it is important to also include uh, not only the parents, but the teachers and then also the the uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, volunteer in the village, for example, to participate in this uh, stunting prevention program. 
And then uh, another program that we are developing, we are also developing an ethno parenting program. So um, uh, this program is basically an ongoing research project. So we've started uh, the program in 2019 uh, with some uh, focus group discussion, and then we identify the need to develop an ethno parenting model. Why there is a need to develop an ethno parenting model? It is based on our awareness that I think there is a need to develop a culturally sensitive parenting program. Indonesia and also other countries in Southeast Asia are very diverse, very multicultural um, uh, countries. And I think going, going back again to earlier presentation, I very much agree that when we are talking about parenting model, there, there is no one size fits all. There is no one particular model that can fit in all situation. That's why every model, every parenting program always needs to be contextualized, always needs to be adapted. So uh, uh, in our careful analysis, we identify that an existing parenting models might be culturally insensitive because again, Indonesia is a very diverse country. It consists of thousands of different ethnicities. And so we need to avoid what I call homogenization of parenting practices that we need to recognize that there are different practices of parenting. And then again, as I've mentioned before, we also feel that there is a need to go beyond deficit model of parenting. And one of the ways to develop this no this non-deficit model of parenting is that by developing a culturally sensitive model. So in doing so, we are uh, trying to unpacking the cosmological aspect of a particular culture, and then we are trying to explore the roles of culture or belief in, in, in their parenting practices. And then we are also identifying sociological factors and then try to sort of like extract some of the best practices in the truth in the cultural practices so that we can develop an ethno-parenting model. It is an ongoing research project, and we are hoping that you know, uh, with this webinar, perhaps we can also extend the collaboration so that we can continue and escalate this research on the on the wider scale. And then, last but not the least, I just would like to mention that we also have a specific program. Uh, this is not a parenting program, actually. So this is. Um, a comprehensive models about early childhood education care provision using the holistic and integrated approach. But as you can see that in this model, we are developing five different modules. And as you can see, we also have specific modules on parenting in um, uh, module number two. And again, this module also is also based on the child's rights perspective. So we are trying to inform parents, to inform teachers about the need to incorporate child rights perspective in their uh, teaching practices. Because I think regardless that there exist cultural differences in parenting, but I think if there, there is something that we can all agree is that it has to be based on the child right principle. And last but not the least, we also conducted the mindful parenting. So this uh, parenting model is actually inviting the parents to be reflective with their own uh, parenting practices and then trying to identify some of the best practices that they can navigate to become a better parents. So uh, I'm aware with the time because I think I've received the message that my time is up. So sorry, I'm a little bit rushed, but I'm really hoping that this webinar can initiate further discussion and perhaps um, expanding a future collaboration um, uh, with other uh, counterparts. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vina, for the presentation. We are now ready to proceed uh, with, um, with the presentation, the second set of uh, presentations. Uh, we, the first to present is... Is Dr. Chanvit uh, Taratep former Inspector General for Administrative Region 8 of the Bureau of Inspection of the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. Uh, he will present to us positive parenting for Thai parents under the auspices of the Parenting for Lifelong Health. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Mongolia, the One Sky Family Skills Training Program uh, that will be presented by Gerald Tuya Shagmid who is the program director of One Sky for All Children in Mongolia. And then the third presenter, we return to Southeast Asia and Myanmar to learn from how to create an enabling environment for women working in the garment factories to improve nutrition of their children and themselves. And we are happy to have with us our friends from UNICEF to do the presentation, namely Sanjay, Sanjay Kumar Das and Win Le, 
both of whom are from the nutrition program of UNICEF Myanmar. And finally, we move to India with the presentation of Pratham Education Foundation through uh, Samyukta Subrabanyan, program lead of the early years program at Pratham, one of India's largest nonprofits focused on improving quality of education. Uh, she will be presenting uh, Karona Todi Masti Todi Padhai, one of the programs that they have adjusted to improve parenting and caregiving practices and the well being of young children in India in the context of the pandemic. We are now running out, out of time. Uh, time check, it's already 5 32 uh, p.m. Uh, Singapore time. Uh, I think we need a little bit of, um, we, we might go over time by uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, I hope that is okay with all of you given the rich presentations, but please do uh, uh, stay with us for the last four presentations. So we begin with you, over to you, Dr. Chandri. Thank you, Shara. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you the AF Regional Health Office that consists of seven provinces uh, located in the northeastern part of Thailand with a children population more than 900,000 who are our target for child protection. But we have only 88 one-stop crisis center for the treatment and rehabilitation, women and children violence victims, and just only less than 30 social workers. So most of the activities were done by the graduated nurses. Anyway, the OSCC Information Center shows that the increasing incidence of child violence at school, domestic, and also community setting Then why we need the PLH program? Because the traditional child protection practice have failed us. Because we lack the members of social workers and resources to deal with the consenting growing numbers of abuse cases. We need it because the only way we can elevate child protection practice is in proactively preventing a child from becoming a victim. Okay, to prevent all children from violence, we need effective active surveillance system that can screen and cover all children. So you know, the UNICEF and Regional Aid Health Office under Ministry of Public Health initiate the child shield the surveillance system by developed risk screening model from OSCC records. This is a machine learning model and screen more than 900,000 children in the seven provinces. So now we are already able to identify children who are at risk of being abused. Then we need the provide effective prevention measure to these free children so we can prevent them to become violence victims. The PRH program was introduced to Thailand as a research at Udon Thani province, one of the seven provinces in our region a few years ago. The PRH could decrease child abuse negative parenting, child behavior problems, and also the guardian's health problems as shown in this slide. So now we have PLH as the evidence-based intervention. So the PLH should be included into the big picture of the child protection. We can utilize the community and local resources and provide technical support include the facilitators for each PLH class, 
with acceptable cost as shown in this slide. I will not mention too much theory, but just would like to conclude that the changes depend on the positive relationship building, positive reinforcement, and then positive discipline. So with the PLH, we are able to take these children who have been identified by the risk assessment model and put them and their parents through interventions that have been designed to reduce or eliminate the risk that can potentially lead to their abuse. And the lesson that we have learned so far from the PRH program is that digital training can be done effectively, especially during the COVID-19 era, and may be continuing to comply with the future next normal ecosystem. Using the child shield system, we will be able to follow up on the result of each parents that have undertaken the program to assess the effectiveness of the programs. Our PRH program will allow the mix and match of talents from low, medium, and high risk groups to maximize effectiveness of the program and ensure the safety of our participants. By doing so, we want to see accurate risk model screening to cover all children in the region. The child shield surveillance system and we also need the evidence-based intervention for the risk children, the PIH program. And then the case management for support, the victim, when our system fell, the Pimelo case management application support by UNICEF can support this and integrate all components together to create the feedback loop the feedback group can improve child protection in Thailand. As seen on this workflow, the children and families information were collected by integrated or 88 provincial and district hospital and also 800 sub-district health promoting hospital information system. The machine learning model will identify the risk children from electronic med court and classify into high, medium, and low risk, probability to be violent victims. The process should be notified and risk confirmed by OSCC staff. And these children and families would be included into the PRS class for eight weeks to reduce that, the risk and prevent them to become victim. The ideal outcome is that the intervention works and that the children is kept in community pool, but the system has been designed so that safety net exists to help the child even when an intervention would fail. The failed case information would feedback to improve machine learning model in case the fail was identified as no risk. And if the risk children become victim, we need to improve the intervention. We hope that with this platform, we can eradicate violence against children in Thailand. I will finish my presentation at this slide and welcome for every question and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chanvit, for the presentation. We now move to Mongolia after Thailand. May we hear from Jeril Tulia for the One Sky Family Skills Training Program. Over to you. Yes, thank you. And hello, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our program, uh, parenting program in Mongolia to all of you. And also thank you so much for the accepting to present our program in this uh, webinar. Yeah, and firstly, I would like to introduce about our uh, One Sky. Uh, our founder, uh, Jenny Bowen, established One Sky in 19, 
and the one sky is a global angel that trains caregivers in high quality early childhood care and education for yeah, vulnerable young children. And uh, we do have the uh, more than 20 years experience of the training caregivers in law resource settings across China, Vietnam, and Mongolia. And uh, we do have this uh, very good curriculum inspired by the Reggio Emilia and based on the leading early childhood development science. And this program curriculum is uh, translated into Mongolian. And so uh, also we do have the very good partnership with the government, the NGO and communities to reach the most vulnerable young children. And we are very proud of our global recognition by the ARNEC as the best uh, practice ECD parenting program and by the World Bank as a teacher's innovative teacher's professional development program. And uh, our Vietnam program is involved in the research of the Harvard University and these kind of things uh, uh, we are very proud of our organization. And you can see over here about uh, our impact across uh, Asia. And uh, in 1998, we established our program in China and continued by the 2017 in Vietnam. And 2018, we established our program in Mongolia. And 2020, we established a very big uh, child-friendly center of uh, for in Hong Kong. And so uh, in Mongolia, and you can see over here, the photos of the gear areas where we work. This is the gear area. Uh, the most families, they are used to migrate from the countryside to the city. And they um, uh, used to having the low resource uh, uh, settings. And so in 2015, the World Bank completed the assessment in the base uh, that uh, based uh, on that uh, research about the young children in care areas left behind in all five domains of the early childhood development. And so uh, we uh, established our uh, Mongolian program in 2018. And after needs assessment and in partnership with the government and the NGO communities, uh, one sky now we are currently training and supporting parents to provide quality responsive care for the vulnerable children living in the care areas of Ulaanbaatar. And uh, our family center training, you can see over here. This is the community uh, family center. And the one big gear, it uh, uh, functions as a training space. The smaller gear, it's uh, for the children, uh, children's play area and the while the parents attending the training. And also family, this family center serves as a hub for the One Sky team and team of trainers and coordinators. And uh, we do have the library and some learning resource materials for the parents and families. And also we used to host uh, the community events at the family center. And you can see over here the, our staff, total of the 12 staff working in Mongolia to, in order to reach our uh, goal of the uh, parenting training. And so you can see over here about the parents training at the family centers and uh, uh, we translated our curriculum, and uh, when we started our program in 2020, and during that time, the, we asked the parents to come 18 weeks, but it was uh, very difficult uh, for the uh, having in Mongolia to uh, come 18 weeks, and that's why we uh, combined uh, some sessions, and now we uh, used to having the, our training for the eight weeks with the 18 sessions and including the role play group discussions and also ask to having the, some uh, homeworks for the parents. And uh, after then we expanded our uh, 
program at the partnership. For example, you can see over here, we partnered with the, some angels in Mongolia. And also we did uh, some training at the public in the gardens and the parents uh, whose children are age uh, two to three. And um, just uh, I before mentioned about uh, we do have this uh, smaller girl that is the, we named as a baby girl and the children they used to stay here and uh, our trainers and training assistant used to support their uh, development. Uh, and we do have the toys and books uh, that is the age appropriate. And uh, of course, so uh, we also had uh, some difficulties during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, during that time, our trainers, uh, uh, teachers called uh, all families and uh, used to give the, some instruction uh, with the short videos through the Facebook and uh, children. They used to do in the, some homeway toys with their uh, parents when they had uh, this under the lockdown. And after the nine months lockdown, we asked the, our first uh, uh, training parents to come to the training. And uh, we had the first graduation uh, in, uh, 2021 and 52 parents graduated of that training. And from these um, uh, trainees, we hired uh, the training assistant who completed the training. And uh, also we used to do in the partnership training at the kindergartens and angels because uh, it's uh, the parents training, skills training is a very first model first training in Mongolia. And so we really want to reach the more families and uh, more parents. That's why we are doing the angel training. And uh, we used to have in the, after the eight weeks uh, training, we used to organize the graduation. And uh, during that graduation, we invited uh, the uh, officials from the Ministry of Education and also the donor organization, for example, Larinet Foundation and the Dizzy Group, we invited them. And uh, you can see over here the, all the graduated numbers of the trainees. And uh, now, at the total of the 586 uh, parents graduated our parents' uh, skills training. And uh, now it's a six round training is going. The, uh, soon we will do the six uh, round of the graduation. And uh, from this year, 2022, uh, we started to pilot in the toy book kits for the families. As you know that uh, the families, uh, they uh, have a very limited uh, possibility to buy the toys and books. And so this uh, toy book kit is a very uh, good for the families to uh, develop their children at home while they attend the training. And they used to uh, take uh, one kit for a week and after then they come back and they change the uh, kids at uh, kids toy book kids is uh, consisting of the two uh, uh, toys and one books and with the instruction of the homemade homemade toys etc and uh, this is the uh, different by the ages for example zero to one and one to two point and two point four years old children also we um, in order to having the more uh, alternative forms of taking childcare uh, services. And we uh, started to pilot in cooperative play care group at the family center and used to do in the, some community days at the uh, family center. And you can see over here the, our impact in Mongolia. And we do have the, our internal monitoring system. And during that time, the, uh, who attended in the training and they have the very high satisfaction with the, our training program and the 100% improved knowledge. 
And uh, we do have the very good uh, partnership with the Ministry of Education and the Preschool Education Division officials. They visited to our family center and also very good that the uh, minister um, Mr. Inka Mokzang also visited to our family center. And so it means that he emphasized during the visit about uh, really we need to uh, partner and uh, also our family center, it's uh, located at the horror level. And horror level, it means that we have a very good collaboration with the horror government and also hospital. And so this model, it's a very good model for the scale up the for the other horrors and uh, uh, psalms. And uh, he emphasized about uh, that it's a very good model for the scale up and uh, he's uh, looking for the, some funding for this kind of the family uh, centers uh, financing. And you can see about the uh, parents expression and Really, after the training, the parents really they very uh, impressive about uh, this uh, parent uh, uh, program, and uh, so we really want to reach the many people, many parents, uh, and also responsive care is uh, somehow the new terminology for families, and so we need to. Uh, change the attitude and the behaviors of the all caregivers. And yeah, this is the, our program so far. And uh, I hope uh, after this webinar, we will have the, some collaboration uh, among the organization. And thank you for organizing this kind of the very good uh, webinar. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Gerald Tuya. May, may we now call on Sanjay and Winle for the presentation in Myanmar. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Joy. And also thank you very much to the organizers for providing opportunity to share our experience. Uh, we'll share the experience from the Myanmar regarding the creative in inhabiting environment for women working in garment factories for better nutrition of the children and for themselves. Uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, presentation we are going to do together with uh, my colleagues, Winle. So yeah, next slide, Winle. Yeah. So in this one, mainly we'll be sharing uh, project background, then action intervention, and then results, lesson learned challenges. Uh, next one. So garment factory is uh, one of the emerging sectors in Myanmar and almost a half million people are working in those garment factories, out of which 90% are female from the age group 18 to 35 years. Most of, uh, from different study, we observe that most of those women are malnourished and even they don't have adequate time to take care of their children. So their children are, are also malnourished. And one of the reasons for that is the workers in garment factory come early morning around 7.30 or 8 a.m. and they stay there until 5 p.m. So this is a long separation between children and their parents, especially the mothers. At, at the same time, uh, we observe that most of the workers do not have awareness about the labor law and their right to the protection, maternal protection, parental leaves, and possible support for the breastfeeding child care. So based on that, UNICEF had the urban nutrition strategy. And as part of that, we designed a program to create an enabling environment uh, for better nutrition of mothers themselves and also promote the care of their children for exclusive breastfeeding, complementary feeding, and better parenting. Uh, for that one, we selected whole factories for the pilot study after the project is designed. And the main purpose was to create an enabling environment in those four factories so that 
workers can also get uh, proper nutrition for their own health. At the same time, they will be that some child friendly space, breastfeeding corners, so that mother can take a small break and provide uh, proper support and uh, breastfeeding, complementary feeding to their children. Next one. So these are some of the interventions we conducted. Uh, the first week, we coordinated with the Myanmar Garment Management Association. These are professional association, higher level coordinating body in the country. And in collaboration with them, we conducted an initial rapid assessment uh, in those pilot factories. Based on that assessment, uh, we designed uh, some nutrition and child care related uh, PCC materials to create, create awareness among the workers. And we also advocated for creating a breastfeeding corner and child care room within each factory. Uh, you can see in the picture on the top, there is one example of uh, breastfeeding space and uh, with some toys where the children can play. At the same time, we also observed during the assessment that most of the workers have some health problems uh, and uh, it was very ethical to uh, address those health related issues and it will also link with the better performance in the factories. So in that way, we negotiated with uh, uh, factory owner. Uh, in the beginning for the first uh, six months, we deployed some mobile team with uh, doctor and nurses for monthly checkup of those uh, workers in the factories. And later on, uh, based on this experience, the owner agreed to set up uh, the clinic within their own factories because anytime the, uh, the workers can get sick. And at the same time, uh, they also ensured the proper facilities in the canteen so that uh, we, after providing the education, we ensured there's a diversified nutritious food with the cheap price so that when there's a lunch break, the uh, factory workers can get proper nutrition. And we also advocate uh, in the same period for the parental leaves and break for the breastfeeding, especially for the newly uh, delivered mothers. At least uh, 14 days, 14 weeks uh, paid maternity leave and one hour breastfeeding breaks when the lactating mothers or breastfeeding mothers are coming for the work. So these are some of the key activities we delivered. Uh, next slide. And then uh, we also distributed some PCC materials like you can see the nutrition packs, uh, nutrition promotion materials, uh, and uh, uh, a ball where is a picture of four kinds of diversified nutritious food. And we encouraged mother when you are doing feeding uh, to your children, try to select at, at least one items from each of those food groups which are linked with the proper growth development of their children. And now my colleagues, uh, Winley will share a small video about you, Winley. Uh, yes, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Winley Le from Myanmar. Uh, thanks again for this uh, opportunity and uh, very nice to meet you all virtually. Uh, so for the next part of the presentation, uh, I'm going to share a short video with uh, some of the activities from our project. I hope uh, you all can see and, and hear the video.
Thank you. Um, so this is about uh, this is the brief about our project and hope uh, it helps you to have a better understanding of the of the um, our project. Um, so next slide, please. So as uh, as a result, uh, as the key result of the project, uh, it has been uh, able to um, establish breastfeeding and child caring room and uh, uh, clinic facility in the three piloted factories and another factory with upgrading canteen and uh, hygiene facilities. Uh, and also the labor law awareness session, uh, including the bed and leave and tie dead men were also delivered um, in the three piloted factories. Um, so there are 600 factory workers uh, with uh, majority uh, female workers were supported with nutrition packs and nutrition promotion materials um, for promotion of time feeding and uh, good parenting practices. Also, um, the factories have uh, recruited uh, trade nurse for uh, provision of health and nutrition services and counseling to mothers working in those uh, government factories uh, for uh, time, caring, time caring and uh, feeding practices. In addition, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the established uh, breastfeeding spaces are equipped with IC materials, uh, twice and uh, anthropometric equipment, ensuring the uh, privacy and confidentiality of uh, mothers and uh, uh, their, uh, their pa uh, pa parents, uh, parents and you know, their patients at the clinics. Uh, lastly, uh, more than 600 workers are including 471 female workers were uh, provided, supported with uh, periodic mobile health and nutrition services, um, including COVID testing and general health, general health uh, medical checkup uh, from this project. So this is the last part of our presentation. Um, in terms of lesson learned, um, uh, we have learned that multi-stakeholder coordination and advocacy are needed among uh, sand business network, private sectors, um, government, uh, government factories in, in this case, um, government association and UN agency to, uh, to create an enabling environment for success of this uh, new initiative. And also the close monitoring and on-site coaching are needed uh, to ensure uh, adoption of those uh, new behaviors. And also it is important uh, use of the social media and uh, multi-web platforms uh, to reach more people with healthy and uh, better caring practices. So regarding challenges, um, uh, our project started, uh, was started last year, uh, and uh, there has been some challenges because of uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, military takeover last year, uh, resulting uh, delay implementation of, of project activities. Also, uh, limited funding for scaling up of this project as the current funding we have uh, now have been prioritized for humanitarian and emergency responses uh, given the current evolving crisis in Myanmar. Um, the last uh, but not the least, uh, unpredictability and uncertainty have uh, created insecurity and threats among those uh, factory workers and owners uh, because of the current um, challenging and um, uh, complex, uh, complex uh, political situation in here uh, in Myanmar. Uh, so this is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you very much and over to you, Joe. Right, thank you. Uh... Win Le and Sanji for the presentation. We now go to the last presentation, but not least. May we call on um, Samyukta of Pratam India, please. Over to you. Thank you, Joel. I hope you're able to see my screen. And uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation, all the panelists. Um, it was very informative. And a big thank you to all of you for staying back and uh, um, listening to our presentations, uh, especially the Myanmar one and the uh, uh, India one. Uh, thank you so much. I'll try to be quick uh, because I know everyone has other things to attend to. Uh, I am from Pratham and um, uh, uh, Pratham is a pan-India organization. We also work in other countries now and we work largely on the quality of education. Uh, that is the age group of 3 to 14 years. We support children in government institutions wherever uh, uh, wherever required. We work in many different states. And today I am representing the early years team here at Pratham. And by early years, I mean that I am part of the initiative where we support children in preschools as well as in grades one and two uh, in many different states of India. So we work uh, in two ways uh, at Pratham. 
one is directly which means in different villages different of different states um uh, we work with communities through volunteers uh, we also work through community based preschool centers that are run by the government uh, these are called anganwadis and they support the 0 to 6 year age group we work on early childhood care and education and so that's the 3 to 6 year age group um and there we engage with uh, young children and we engage with them directly in centers but also through their parents and quite often uh, uh, their mothers and I'll talk more about how we engage with them and how this engagement really helped us um, in the work that we did during COVID. We also partner with governments where uh, there is a possibility so in different states in partnership with the state government um, such as Punjab, Haryana, Himachal, Andhra Pradesh in the south uh, but also with district governments uh, in different states. And then we partner with the government to co-create the content that goes out to support with the training on early childhood education, to support with monitoring and assessment and hands-on support that is required. Um, we do that wherever it's possible in large government partnerships. So we have two kinds of partnerships. One is with the, one is direct and with communities and the other is with the government. Um, I'll move now to what did we do pre-pandemic. So before COVID, we were working in government-based preschool centers, uh, but we always had a community component. So engaging volunteers from the communities where these anganwadis or preschool centers are running was very important for us. And with young children, it was quite often um, uh, the adolescent girls who anyway came to these centers for some of the needs that the center met, for example, vitamins and other health-related uh, things and also with mothers of the young children. We also created mothers groups in communities. So uh, we would have children coming to these centers. Their mothers or grandmothers would form a group like a social structure in the community and that group would meet on a regular basis um, each week at least once for a short duration of time and we would send them content that um, they could then use both between each other and also at home. Post pandemic, we had to pivot and uh, we everything everything that we had done so far was all in place. And so this pivoting had to be remote. It was new for us. And we also realized that, that we also realized that education uh, was important, but education and awareness around public health safety and precautions that needed to be taken were even more important. Um, we, one more thing one realized was that there were many videos out there, but in communities where we worked, where let's say water was not available, how do you, uh, you know, save yourself um, in conditions where uh, the, uh, uh, you know, environment is not suited to what is required, especially in terms of COVID precautions. For example, this mug of water that you could use to wash your hands if you don't have running water. These were the kinds of content that we focused on. We focused on mothers playing with their children at home. We did this earlier, but this was a big step forward for us. And also sending messages remotely uh, to parents so that they could do those same activities in groups and individually was a big change. And lots of phone calls, calling people and saying, did you get my message? Will you be doing the activity? Is it really tough? Tell us what you did. Tell us what you found. Um, uh, became very important through the COVID period. Um, so if I move forward in terms of the action that took place during COVID, uh, we call this huge campaign that we ran across the country, uh, Corona Thodi Masti Thodi Padhai. Um, so Corona in Hindi means please do. Okay. And Thodi Masti Thodi Padhai is have a little fun and do a little studies. So Corona Thodi Masti Thodi Padhai, we tried to, uh, you know, it was like a pun and we tried to uh, use this across the campaign in India. Uh, we connected with communities through parents, volunteers, and children. Um, we also continuously had to keep communication on in whatever way possible with the governments. Uh, whenever the government said, do it through IVR, do it through audio calls, do it through radio, we tried to keep communication channels open as much as possible, especially the phone calls. Um, one also had to create content in different languages. So a lot of content is available in, let's say, in uh, English and Hindi, but in other languages, like Korea, Bengal, we need to create easily accessible, simple content for young children. 
and we put it on a Pratham open school platform, which any of anyone here can also use if the language is relevant. We created this in about 11 languages, uh, videos, games, and we also partnered with other, other organizations to use their content. Uh, in terms of other organizations that reached out to us during COVID, there were governments, but there were also not-for-profit organizations. Uh, there was Seva, there were some other self-help groups who said schools are closed, and we need to reach out to our children. How should we do that? So we partnered with them uh, to uh, make the remote learning and the whole plan around it a reality uh, for these organizations. So these were the, our big four C's that we used during the campaign. And um, we must we learned a lot and we created new partnerships uh, for sure. Um, in terms of the communication that we made sure went out uh, through WhatsApp or SMS, uh, this was a typical uh, trajectory that was followed. We had to quickly figure out every day when we send a message, it had to get translated into 11 languages in, on WhatsApp and also on simple phones, which means short messaging services. So for instance, when we sent out messages initially, we found that only about 39, 40% of uh, caregivers, uh, especially mothers had smartphones. So we needed to create messages in both SMS as well as in, on WhatsApp. We would create it centrally, then it would get translated regionally. And then the person on the ground for us who was on the ground, a Pratham person or a volunteer would, call, would send out that message and also call to clarify. Call the parent to say, did you get the message? Did you understand it? Do you need anything? And the messages were all around about using some local resources to do the activities. And then feedback, which means parents actually sharing back, how was the activity? What happened? Where did they struggle? And this follow-up we realized became very important. And very soon I will share a little bit more around follow-up, but that human connect of talking to uh, parents um, ensured that the activity that we sent out was actually done. And these were all playful activities that uh, we could see where children and parents were having fun and also communicating with each other. Uh, um, uh, and that uh, became a routine which people followed every day. So for instance, here's an example. We sent out a message around plants, parts of the plant, and parents would be really excited and they would send back what they did with their children in their communities, bring children from the uh, adjoining houses or even children in their own homes and go out, look at these plants and tell us what they did with the activity. This is how they would share their feedback with us. I will share another example here of SMS, where you know audio and visual aids are, are very difficult and there's a word limit on the messages we send out. Yet for little children, we would send out a message like this, where you have, uh, let's say you have a bag, you need to close your eyes, pull out something and tell and uh, talk about it. Or let's say for fine motor skills, peel the peas, peel the garlic, peel those little things that are in your house together with the parent. And uh, initially we were perplexed. We said, if this is an SMS phone, a simple phone, how come we're getting these photographs? What happened was they would go to the neighbor's house or someone who had a smartphone so that they could reach out to us and tell us that they did the activity. So um, we were very humbled by this, that you know they wanted to tell us how they did this. And so they would look for a phone through which they could share this feedback with us. Um, with different governments, we tried to collaborate in uh, what uh, was being suggested in that state. So for example, with the Delhi government, uh, they preferred to use an IVR system where, where a child can press the grade of her class. So if I'm in class one, press one, and then uh, pick up the, uh, 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 you get a call back, which tells you what is the content? What is that activity you have to do? Uh, in Bihar, for example, they, they knew that TVs are in every home. So let's have a half an hour program for little children that children can watch on a daily basis. So every morning, uh, this uh, program would play and we have to create this program. Uh, there are different content portals. There's a Diksha portal at the national level, but also state portals where we uploaded all the content that we had, whether it was videos, games in different languages, uh, which was anywhere in the public domain, but also all our messages. Uh, in partnership with different governments, the same method mechanism that we used for WhatsApp and SMS to reach the parent, in state government partnerships, the teachers of the schools or the Anganbadi workers would send out these messages to the parents of the children who were coming to their class. There also the follow-up became very important where the teacher would reach out and say, did you see my message today? 
uh, did you do the activity? Uh, the radio system was one where uh, Maharashtra said there isn't enough uh, 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 penetration of the phone. And so let us use a radio system to reach out to parents. And there, there was WhatsApp, SMS, and also radio to find out what happened. So now very quickly, I'll just share a few learnings uh, from uh, uh, what we did. And I want to share uh, two small things that we learned, uh, which were big for us. Initially, we struggled to say, is this engagement? Is there learning happening? And so when we did a study um, in, uh, in about six states with about 5,000 children, uh, we had worked with these children in September 2019. And um, uh, we came back to say, have children learned? We did many activities with them in person. So we did an assessment in person in September 2019. And we did this again in January, 2021. Um, and what we found was that if children actually completed the activity, engaged with the activity, uh, in, in a small example like that of alphabet recognition, we do see an improvement. The higher the engagement, so for example, if you have about 454 children who were able to complete less than 50% of the activities in the last seven days prior to the assessment, we see some improvement. And if you have about 100% children, if you have 100% completion of activities, we see a very high level of um, uh, learning as well. Um, and this was something that we learned. We kept calling this engagement, but we realized that learning can also take place. Um, and this was done with a set of uh, uh, children, but we realized the follow-up in getting children to complete the activities, therefore, becomes very, very important. We also did one more uh, uh, study to find out about phones and how do they actually impact uh, what parents can actually do with their children. And the uh, learnings of this uh, study were very interesting. But one thing we realized was if there's remote learning and follow up, then improvement does happen. And then, of course, if there's a regular phone, there is improvement. And if there is a smartphone with some audio, which of course has audio visual capacities, then the improvement is even better. So there is a connection between mother's phone, the type of phone she has and performance. But there is also a connection between the remote learning activity and follow up where some improvement can be expected through all the different methods we use during COVID. I'd like to just end by saying that, uh, that while there were many learnings, um, uh, I think two, three big learnings for us was keep the content simple, easy to understand and fun so that parents and children can engage with each other. Social structures within the community that can take forward this content becomes very important. So for us, it was the mother's groups and the volunteers. And the human connect, talking to people throughout so that they're not alone. Uh, is most important, especially when one can't meet uh, face to face. Thank you so much. Uh, over back to you, Joel. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you to all presenters and speakers, and of course, to our audience for keeping with us uh, over time. Um, we we saw the importance of uh, evidence for parenting support and for. Um, supporting our children across different life uh, stages and also within different diverse contexts. So I guess that is the takeaway for, uh, for this afternoon's uh, webinar. But our commitment is we're looking at your comments and then we will really um, look into how we, we will engage you with better discussions at the second webinar on December 6th. Thanks for bearing with us and for uh, learning with us. And thank you very much to, to our presenters. Let's collaborate. Let's support uh, parenting in the Asia-Pacific region.